welcome everybody from wherever you are. Welcome to Sankofa Talks. This is an intergenerational conversation with myself, Isana Batista, and Cheryl Durant on food justice. So to get started, I'd love to um, have Cheryl um, in, introduce um, herself. Oh wait, am I introducing you? You're introducing me. I'm introducing you, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, Cheryl and I go, go, go a little bit, a little bit back. Um, she is someone who I, I admire a lot. Um, she's an urban farmer, educator, and also a food justice advocate. Um, I met her through her work as a resident garden manager at Kelly Street Garden. Um, as well as when I did my apprenticeship at New Roots Community Farm in the South Bronx, which is managed by the International Rescue Committee. Um, she does a lot of community-based work and transitioned to doing um, food justice and urban agriculture work after working um, for a few years, um, not a few, many years in corporate and institutional marketing. Um, she's also been part of the 2019-2020 HEO School of Political um, Leadership Cohort. Um, and she was also a former Design Trust Fellow for the Farming Concrete Project. So that where, and much more. Where did you find all of that stuff? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So who am I, Cheryl? Who are you? You're somebody who um, I also greatly admire. And um, I I, th I thought it was an honor to meet you and work with you um, as, our, as our community chef um, at Kelly Street Garden. I know you through your, um, your cooperative, Woke Foods. I know you through the work that you have done with us at Kelly Street Garden, educating youth and community members about nutrition and um, and how to prepare plant-based meals on a budget. I think that was pretty stellar. And your depth of knowledge around, you know, not because we are poor or we live in under-resourced communities means that we should be denied um, access to good, healthy food. Um, beside that, we both went to farm school at NYC, so we are both alums. And uh, we both work in urban agriculture, although you took it a step further and went and, and did permaculture design, something I admire, but I never embraced. Um, I like other people who do it. And um, I kind of envy that you're, you've left New York City and are now living in the Dominican Republic. So that's um, you in a nutshell. There is more, but um, we can get into that later. Yes, 100%. Okay, so now we're moving into an icebreaker, which we don't know what it is. <laughs> Let's see. Oh. Share one thing that reminds you of where you're from. Hmm. That's a good question. Yeah, that's a great question. There's so much going through my mind right now. Because one, I am very grateful, very blessed, like you mentioned, to be living again in my homeland um, of the Dominican Republic. And I, I feel like I'm surrounded by all the things that remind me of where I'm from. But mostly the things that remind me about where I'm from is where um, people unexpectedly show up to your house just to see how you're doing. Yeah, that's something that would also happen when I lived in New York. Like I, you know, I grew up in Harlem and sometimes like the intercom would sound and you know, it would just be like a family member or a neighbor. I feel like recently that has shifted where everything's scheduled, even like friend meetups. It's like, you know, send you a calendar invite to know that you're gonna have a phone conversation. So those like unexpected visits, um, just to catch up, drink a little coffee or drink some juice um, in someone's home reminds me about um, my people. What about you? Me, um, just living in the South Bronx reminds me of where I'm from because there's such a rich 
and diverse population, and a lot of them are from the Caribbean. But there's one thing that always reminds me of Jamaica, which it's a treat for me like every every weekend is to order food from a Jamaican restaurant called Bickles because they cook the second best oxtail that I've ever had. <laughs> So that reminds me of that it reminds me of my father's cooking, oxtail. So yeah. Beautiful. Um, mm -hmm. All right. So what's next? <laughs> <laughs> so now we're moving into the actual Sankofa talk. So this means we're gonna be presented with some questions um, and we'll have the opportunity to answer them. What does food justice mean to you? Sure, I feel like giving you the opportunity to answer this one first. That's such an unfair thing for you to do. Uh, food justice, it's a deep, deep phrase. Um, and, um, you know, a lot of us think of food justice as being about sovereignty, being about um, access to land, being about having access to how you distribute and prepare your own food, um, uh, being about um, uh, stewardship of land versus ownership of land. Um, but for me, um, food justice is like the gateway for all things justice because without everybody having access to healthy, um, clean, affordable food that they have a say in how it is grown and how it is prepared, then whatever other types of social justice that we em embark on, it is it, not that it is meaningless, it is harder to attain uh, because food is, for me, the basic physiological need of every single human being on the planet. And if they are de denied food or denied access to it, then there it, it affects their physical, emotional, and spiritual well-being. And um, it is very oppressive when um, we live in a hyper-capitalistic society where access to food is dependent on who you are ethnically, where you live, how much money you have, and um, therefore it denies you uh, your rightful place on the planet to be a holistic and grounded human being. So when I think about food justice, I think about that is where we need to start when we talk, when we think about our evolution to universal justice. Yeah, I completely agree, especially given that the reason why we're even needing justice to begin with is because um, you know, many, many of our people were, were colonized through land and through food. And that is how, um, you know, capitalism started. It started, you know, through selling, you know, sugar cane of, of corn, of cotton, you know, that importing, exporting, all of that. And so it's really like at, at the root of so many of our injustices of, yeah. of economic injustice, of racial injustice, all of it really starts with um, the the taking of land so that mm -hmm. then that land could be used to extract its natural resources through food and, and through other ways. And so, yeah, for me, food justice is righting those wrongs and returning to um, to returning land and giving food you know, food should be free. It um, should be free. Uh, yes, the, the whole idea of commodifying food, something that the planet provides to us free and a bounty of, because make no mistake, there is enough food on the planet. It's 100%. just how our, econ how our economic systems are structured that denies people food. And the fact that it, um, in exchange for your labor is how you get food. And even then, sometimes in exchange for your labor, you are also denied food. You know the 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 the, the 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 total injustice of that. The total, it's it's so unempathetic. It's just so cruel that um you know that land is privatized. There is no longer any um 
the, the public commons is constantly, you know, at stake where it's difficult for you to just, you know, exist on the planet that we didn't, we didn't invent, we didn't create. It was given to us freely to steward. And this is exactly. what, <laughs> and this is what we have done to it. Exactly. Because, you know, our people, you know, specifically, um, black, indigenous, and other people of color, our practices are about being in, in, in a reciprocal relationship to Mother Earth. Mm -hmm. And so this idea of buying land is like, you cannot buy land. You yes. take care of it. You are a guardian of it. Mm -hmm. You, um, you know, you, you plant seeds and, and you, you grow food and then you eat it and then you return it back you know, through what we now call compost. And so it's like this reciprocal relationship that we've had with, with, with food and land that has been stripped away um, through different systems of oppression. And so for me, food justice is people knowing that history because there is not enough um, education on, on how we are even where we are. Mm -hmm. So that's one. And then two, creating the possibility so that we can return to those practices of being in right relationship with with earth and with food and you know to go even further to understand why we have so many myriads of our other problems like in, in terms to in, in terms of things like not only physical but mental health that mm -hmm. we en encounter because of these oppressive structures is directly connected to land um, the barriers that we put up to even putting our feet on the land. We work, we walk on sh with shoes and concrete. That also is oppressive. You know, the way we build the cities, um, you know, and, and the way people, people live is oppressive. And, um, the way we are no longer living in communities or tribes where we are, um, where we live in a communal way and work for the common good of, of, of the tribe, that that is also oppressive because you know, whenever we have garden days at Kelly Street Garden, all you have to do is see people put their hand in the soil and there is a complete transformation of their well being. Complete. I experienced that. I remember the first time I volunteered at one of, um, it was actually a rice and root farm mm -hmm. um, in upstate New York. And I remember I put my hands in the soil and I literally started crying. Because I had had a really hard, I, I was having a really hard time and I had just been diagnosed with like anxiety. And I was just like, I don't know if I really believe that diagnosis. Um, I think it's literally just a sort of oppression, like taking pieces from me each day. And I put my hand in that so and literally my job was just picking weeds or weeds. Um, and, and yeah, that was the day where I was like, this is what I want to do. I always want to have my hands in soil. I want my feet, my hands to be touching earth as much as possible because this is so, this feels so healing. This feels like I'm connected to, to everything and also connected to nothing at the same time. Yeah, I like that phrase, connected to nothing. It's as if um, in the scheme of the larger universe, you are aware of your nothingness. And that is yes. that is that is transformational. That in itself, you know, is is, is transformational. And um, uh, you know, for us to the only way that you can experience that is to be in concert with nature, to be in concert with the land. And it's not. Um, I don't think it's a the powers that be, those that the 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 one percent or those that command the the, the wealth of this planet, it's not a mistake that um, the, the, the oppressive systems that they put in place is to divorce us from from the land because it's it's the only way that you can control people is to divorce them from land, divorce them from their food systems, which are tied to their, not only their ethnicity, but their cultural um, mm -hmm. as well. And when you take away that from them, you take away their agency, you take away their self-worth and and, and when you do that, you can subjugate and dominate people. And that's the essence of colonialism and imperialism right there. So until we have real, real justice, food justice, um, we can't achieve any other form of justice. Yes, 100%, um, completely agree. I also think that food justice um, means the, that I had 
that I got to learn um, from people like you, people who 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 looked like me, people who reminded me of my people. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, that that was that's also a piece of, of food justice. So mm -hmm. I wanted to, to add that. Yeah, no, that's a that, that that's a that, that's a very good point. Um, it's <laughs> it's so interesting how the forms of injustice and oppression um, are it put in place to have us be at odds with one another and take our eye off the the, the main system of oppression take our eye off again take our eye off the prize the prize that needs to be dismantled you know because we have um internalized our prejudices we have internalized our hate and we exacerbate our um differences when we should celebrate our differences as a way to engage more with 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 humans on the planet because differences is what enriches lives it enriches us um it enriches our well-being um makes makes us um interesting <laughs> you know mm -hmm. and um it, it it the the way injustice just permeates every every aspect of your life it's 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 kind of oppressive and you know with the advent of covid and it's something that i have to talk about because being um quarantined being separated from others being it's kind of the way we are now is kind of antisocial because be, because of COVID, and we are he, we, we are we are at this juncture with COVID because we have disrespected the planet. It's it, it, I mean we have um, part part of um, why we experience what we experience is because we have uh, extracted so much from the planet because we have not paid attention to taking care of the planet. You know, so we open up the opportunities opportunities for opportunistic diseases. Um, um, to to happen, you know, because um, we have so scarred the land, and our punishment is to be separated from each other. But what it has done for me is to put a pause and a, a way for me to reassess what is what is truly important and why I do this work, and why it is important for us to do this work, uh, and why it is important for for us to reset the planet reset our lives and start from ground zero because we can't evolve to a higher plane until we right those wrongs. Yes, agree. So we have this next question. What's a misconception your generation has about mine and why do you think that is? Hmm. I'm gonna let you start off there. You okay. are, you are, you are the youth. <laughs> I, I think the misconception. I love it. <laughs> I think a misconception that your generation, and I'm also basing this off um, people in my life that are from your generation, so maybe not you per se. Um, but I think there is a misconception that we, um, yeah, that we don't want to work. And I think that is because there is, there has been a lot of ad, um, advancement with like, you know, modern things. I think it's also for specifically for, for BIPOC um, people for my generation. Um, I think a lot of us are realizing that one of the ways that systems of oppression tries to get us is by overworking. And so we're kind of, you know, resisting and are like, we need to rest, we need to take things slowly. Um, and then your generation is like, you need to do, you need to take action. And we're like, yes. And we also need to take a nap. So <laughs> I think that, um, yeah, so I say that would be like a misconception from our generation. I'm gonna piggyback off of that because about my son is gonna be 21 this year, so um, about when he was around five, I went on a school trip with him and I was introduced to one of his um, advisors. And we were discussing, you know, politics and other and other and other um, 
socioeconomic constructs. And he introduced me to a, and I, I had heard of it before, this, this, this piece of literature, but I had never read, um, read it, um, The Case Against Work. And once I read that, um, I became so, it, was, it, it just spoke to me because work, as we define it, should be abolished. Nobody yeah. should work. I agree. Because what work does, it takes away from your search for who you are and what you could be. Um, notice certain types of um, work is demonized or deemed to be the other. If you're a poet, if you're an artist, even if sometimes even if you're a farmer, and certain work is denigrated as unskilled, you know, um, because to justify um, how how people are um, underpaid, the whole idea that the movement, the, um, the 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 work movement had to fight so hard at the turn of the 20th century to get the 40-hour work week is abysmal. The fact that we had slavery, that we had to steal other people to be able to do the backbreaking work and not pay them is is that is the height of height of oppression. I think that um, so the idea the idea that if there is a conception a, a conception or misconception out there that makes the younger generation feel that the older generation feels that they should not work. I think we need to examine has work in the traditional way been good to us? You know, has it allowed us the the the, the um the space to to self-actualize, to be all that that we can be all that quote unquote we can we can be. And it when we truly examine that, are we really and truly satisfied with that concept? Of work, I like going out into the garden and gardening, and nobody has to tell me to go out there and garden. I don't consider it work. I can't, I consider it part of who who I am. Part of the reason why I no longer work in corporate America and marketing is that I hated that stuff. Mm -hmm. I you know, I would get up on in Monday mornings and um, you know, have a pit in my stomach about going to work. You know that I have to leave my home. I have to leave my child. I have to leave and be somewhere else with folks who. Sometimes don't treat me well simply because of the color of my skin or the sound of my accent, and um, you know, and then that constitutes work and the right way to be to be in society. But for me, what I think a misconception that older people have of younger people is that we feel that we're the only mentors and young people can't be mentors. And I and I totally disagree with that. I think we can mentor each other because. Um, there are ways in which the youth live and there are um, innovations that the youth embrace that I know, know nothing of and I can learn from. And there is wisdom in having lived this long and having experienced certain things that I can share. I used to, um, when I started this work, I used to push youth, um, youth-centric programs and then I began to, to realize that this is all nonsense. I should be pushing intergenerational programs because I think everybody can learn from everybody and everybody should learn from everybody and we should all be humbled by everybody else's existence. And I came to this belief because I, you know, I was reading about a, an indigenous tribe in South America where um, the, the men in the tribe were going fishing and a six, one of the six, a little six year old girl asked to go on, on this fishing trip with them and they did not say no. She found a place, she was given a place on the boat, on the river, and it was a, it was customary that this was the fluidity between the generations within that particular um, Amazonian tribe. And we don't live like that. We think of the compartmentalized youth do this, you know, adults do this. You must respect your elders, even if they're toxic and oppressive, <laughs> and, opp and oppressive to you. And it's like it's it it is nonsense. We must respect each other. We must learn to live in concert with each with 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 each other. So yeah, that that is one of the things that I've learned that we are all mentors to each other because every man can do what every man can do, and we have different skill sets. We have different. Um, um, levels of understanding and uh, it can benefit our evolution.
I love that so much. I really do. Thank you. All right, what's the next question? What is one aspect of our history as it pertains to food justice that you wish more people knew about? Um, I'd say for me, you know, given that right now um, I'm in, you know, my homeland, the island of Haiti side that is, you know, now called the Dominican Republic, I wish that more people talked about or knew that this this island um, that, that colonizers was called Hispaniola was really like ground zero for so much of, um, of like, you know, the racism, the system of oppression and, and, and land, land colonization and all of the things that I mentioned earlier. Um, I feel like, um, there is, yeah, there is a really rich and important, um, conversation, um, and and the history of 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 like the, the black south um and how much of um folks who were enslaved through the transatlantic slave trade um you know had to work in the in 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 the black south um but there isn't a a connection as to how um you know those black people were were stripped and um, really like their spirits were really torn down through land work on this island specifically first. And then, you know, the, the ship makes its way to other piece, other parts of the, the United States and other parts of the Caribbean as well. So yeah, I think that is, um, you know, very important to food justice because, you know, again, we are, we are, making the connection that land was being acquired and colonized and taken and stolen mm -hmm. so that crops could grow and then those crops could be used um, to be exchanged for money mm -hmm. and for white people specifically to accumulate and generate wealth at the, at, at the expense of, of like indigenous people being, being murdered. Um, and then, um, Black people being brought to to the to, to that stolen land and being forced to give their free labor. So yeah, it's, even talking about it right now, I realize it's, it's super heavy. I, I wish there was more more conversations about this land specifically being the ground zero where all so much of this um, um, oppression and violence was practiced by colonizers. I will go even further to say that, um, that, that I totally agree with you. It was, it actually, it was ground zero and some of the most horrendous um, genocidal practices first were occurred on the island of Hispaniola um, and were exported to other parts of the Western hemisphere. Uh, I would go further to say that a lot of the regenerative practices that we have that have now been co-opted um, in the modern in modern agricultural practices, we need to learn that they already existed. They're ancient practices that we are rediscovering. Yes, and, um, and we need a more honest and more and a, a more honest history and a more common history so that we know these things and we give um, credence to, to those, those native um, folks that were um, the stewards or the artists of this type of practice. They are the ones who practiced it. They are the ones who were able to forage best, who are able to have agricultural practices that honored the earth best. And what was appalling to them when the Europeans arrived was that the Europeans would clear land they would plant crops. Many of the crops that they planted were not edible in the quest for money. They would literally plant crops and their, their towns would, would, um, would starve because they were so focused on growing food for money. And nobody talks about the fact that it was the Native Americans that they turned to in their times of starvation and not having enough food. And 
And what was reciprocated was the extermination or the displacement of those Native Americans. Um, what is sad <laughs> is that despite all of this, they never learned how to steward land properly. They never learned how to how to um to grow to go food properly, and they never learned how it's a reciprocal um 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 engagement between humans and the land in order for you to in order for, for us to reap the bounty of the land. The dust bowl is a is a result of not heeding um, those practices and continuing the practice of um, extraction of of um, resources just in by monocropping in exchange for money. And now we are in the 21st century where our agriculture is dominated by big ag and monocropping um, and um, pesticides and the depletion of our topsoil. So now we are turning to GMOs to right that wrong. Um, in, in big ag in particular in, and, and the resistance to regenerative um, practices that were once um, these ancient practices that were once, you know, dominant all, all over the continent. But um, counter to that, those who recognize and, and, and adopt these practices have not, are yet to give credit to those um, indigenous people where yes. these practices come from. I wish people knew knew more about it. This is not new. Nothing is new under the sun. It was it was there before. We forgot about it. We have been forced to go back to it, and we need a common his a common memory in order to acknowledge and give credit where credit is due. Yeah, I mean they you know colonizers really created you know an environment for us to forget it. And earlier you mentioned um, me going, me having my, my permaculture um, design certification. That program was cool. And also so much of what I was learning, um, either, I, either I knew or I knew that it was coming from indigenous knowledge mm -hmm. or it was coming, it was coming from indigenous knowledge um, from, from Africa, but also coming from indigenous knowledge from, from other places. And so some, I I was in like walking on eggshells and really um, there were so many moments where I just had um, just just very uncomfortable with the fact that there was there was no credit you know in permaculture and you know these certifications where people are specifically white people are making so much money from these courses and so much. Um, mm -hmm. Pretty much all of the knowledge is indigenous knowledge that has been packaged and being sold back to us, and that the only reason why we did not do not have, um, you know, our practices in this formal thing called permaculture is because we were interrupted from even getting there. Yeah. And I don't know if like colonization would have never happened. I don't know if we would have ever packaged anything because that's just not how we do things. Um, but, but yeah, so much of, um, even, even, even permaculture or, um, all the, all the new ways of like organic farming, um, never, never talks about why we have to do that in the first place. <laughs> like we, we, we used to do that. The only reason we, um, is, is not common it's not common practices across across um, places and people is because of colonization and racism and that never gets spoken about of course they're never going to talk about it because then they lose money and they'd have to um one give reparations and two um pass us the mic because we're the ones who who have it in our dna to mm -hmm. even um that we don't even <coughs> need some handbook we don't got it. We don't need no certification. It's it's yeah. it's in us. It's in it's in the in, in our in our veins in our hands. Yeah, the idea of credentials too is also a, um, a thorn in my side because it's also um, it's a barrier that is put up so that folks who had the ancient knowledge or it's been passed on from generation to generation get excluded from claiming um, ownership of a practice that was theirs. You know, you know, acupuncture. You need to get certified 
to become an acupuncturist, you know, in a certain way, whereas originally, whereas folks who practice had that practice were, you know, and came to this country and imparted that practice were kept out of it. So yeah, the fact that it is dominated by, of course, white supremacy again, and the commodified, everything is commodified, and and which we, and which and changes it, um, is is why um, <laughs> is why we did need, need to dismantle this and create a more just society. It's such well, a I, such a high mountain, you know. Every time I think about it, it's like I'm gonna die before any of this happens. <laughs> yeah. We're, we're moving into the show and tell portion, but before we do that, I just want to um, highlight a comment um, that, that someone said, greetings for Justice Warriors, indigenous people of North, North California murdered for fire burning technology, now needed to save California from yes. wildfires. Yes. 100%. Yes. Um, I, I recently learned about that, how um, indigenous folks would um, would burn certain trees so that yes. they would be, you know, like um, bracing each other and causing wildfires. Exactly. And they were condemned for it, and now look what's happening. Thank you for saying that. All right, so show and tell. We're ready. <laughs> I love it. So show and tell is um, sorry. I was supposed to say what it what's supposed to. Be. <laughs> so um, <laughs> prior to this event, Cheryl and I sent um, the producers of of CCADI um, a picture of either of some what rep, what um, you know like what this work represents for us. Um, and so we are they're going to show that, and we're going to talk about it. <laughs> oh my god this is my picture this is my favorite picture of all time it's why i do this work this is like oh my god how many years old i was younger then <laughs> when i um when i started um i came back into gardening um i had just this is when i had just um the economy had crashed 2008 and I left, um, um, I left corporate America and I started volunteering in gardens. Um, I found my roots. My father was a farmer in Jamaica. So it's not like I wasn't connected to farming. I just thought that farming was, what's a long story. Farming was for poor folks. Um, <laughs> you know, you can't make any money doing farming. So when I immigrated to the States to go to college, I went to business school, went all the way to my master's, but never finished it. And um, here I am, you know, this cracks my mother up every day. <laughs> here I am back at gardening, back at farming, something that I thought I would, that, that I would never do um, what my father did. So I started a project in Brooklyn when I lived in Brooklyn with an organization called Sustainable Flatbush. Because every day I would garden in this small garden, which was on a, um, the Flatbush Reform Church, um, which was a very diverse neighborhood, lots of Caribbean people. People would stop all the time and say, you should grow this, you should grow that. And it was always some type of herb or medicine um, from our home country um, that they would want me to grow and they would bring seeds or little plants for me to plant. And I came up on the idea that what if we built a medicinal herb garden and had workshops around how to use these herbs. That's how my love of um, of growing herbs, culinary and medicinal herbs came about. And at the time, um, uh, I met a, 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 a an herbalist um, who had just started an apothecary in Brooklyn called Sacred Vibes. And I was, and we are still partners today doing this, this work. And I brought the idea to her and we literally demolished this space on the Flatbush Reform church and started building from scratch raised beds for this medicinal herbal garden which we were going to um, build and develop a curriculum 
to have free workshops from our community. And it was wildly successful. A lot of people would show up. We'd have our, our first workshop was just for women from menstruation to menopause. And we couldn't believe how many women showed up just for this workshop. And um, we partnered, there was a school that was nearby. And you know, um, we thought about how about getting some of these kids involved in um, in helping us to build the garden. Because this group at this, this um, high school, near to us had a program of um, community service and they thought partnering with us to help build this garden was the best thing. And these girls would come in their nice sneakers and nice jeans and they didn't want to get it dirty. And, um, but they were hilarious. They were so funny. And by the time we finished building this garden, they were like knee deep in dirt. They were like the best, group of girls I ever worked with. And I just, this was with us finished building, building the beds and filling all the beds with soil. And I just took this, you know, my friend, I didn't take the picture. They sat, so they sat there and my friend took the picture. And I was like, when she showed me this picture, I was like, wow, this is why I want to do this. This was like to have a bunch of girls come out decked out, nice hair, nice jewelry, nice clothes. And then this is them at the end, you know, Sneakers didn't matter, the jeans didn't matter, they had on the gloves. It was, I, I wish I knew where they were now. This is like 14 years, I was 12, 13 years later. But um, this is a great picture. And I saw the picture on the um, IOB website. They used that picture um, as promotion because we raised money through IOB to yeah. build this garden. And um, they used this picture all the time and it was just like it's just a beautiful picture and it, it, reminds, it reminds me of my work you know and and, and what i do it's yeah beautiful. that's I my love, story. <laughs> yeah I, lo I love i love the joy that that it, yeah that that's coming through through these these young people and the, the enthusiasm for <laughs> yeah <it was> great <laughs> So I think now my picture, okay. So this is my photo that I chose. Um, the, the shorter person is my grandmother, Amada Batista. And then the person next to, next to her, the taller person is um, Chanel Paulino. Um, and I chose this photo because I learned to cook for my grandmother and here she's making um, pastelitos or empanadas and it is you know something that i learned to make from her she would always make it for i don't know i feel like we dominicans make pastelitos for like baby showers birthdays funerals graduations any big thing you're gonna have um pastelitos or empanadas um but what she's stuffing it with is plant-based beef so the reason I like this photo is because while my grandmother um, loves to cook, work, you know, she's, she's, a, she's one of the main cooks for Woke Foods, she's um, been a little bit resistant about the plant-based part. And sometimes it's like, well, why can't we just, you know, put chicken in it? I'm like, well, because, you know, people want no meat. But that's not meat, that's chicken. I'm like, grandma, that's meat. Um, and so... I I just love that this um, you know Chanel is in her early twenties. My grandmother just turned seventy, um, and so one of my dreams when I started Wolf Foods was to have it be an intergenerational cooperative. And so I love that this photo you know represents that um, Chanel is like super passionate about plant based foods and wellness and health. My grandmother loves um, cooking, loves bringing people together through food. Like she loves having gatherings. She loves, um, you know, parties and 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 just you know, even for her birthday, she'll cook like an entire stew, even though it's her birthday. Um, and so this photo for me kind of just brings in these these two um, worlds that should be in more conversation, should be in more collaboration, because like you mentioned, there is um, 
knowledge that can be shared amongst both both and all generations of course and so yeah so i hope that that wolf foods can continue to do that can continue to have um more intergenerational um cooking collaborating um kicking all the things where's the kitchen this is Hotbird Kitchen in, in Hot East Harlem on yeah, yeah. 114 Sun Park. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I love the kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love it too. I hope one day we can have our own kitchen. That'd be good. All right. So now we'll move into personal questions. Hmm. More personal questions. For this piece, um, I sent the producers some personal questions that I have for Cheryl. She doesn't know what they are. And then Cheryl did the same thing for me. So these are gonna be some surprise questions. So Cheryl. Oh yes, I wanna know Cheryl, in what ways, you know, you mentioned being from Jamaica mm -hmm. and migrating here to the United, um, not here, migrating to the United States. <laughs> Out of the United States. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Migrating there. Yeah. Yeah. So in what ways um do you honor your ancestral cultural knowledge while farming in urban spaces? You mentioned like herbs and things like that. So if there, if it's that or if it's more, I'd love to know. Definitely herbs and um the, the tradition of um um uh traditional medicinal herbs and um you know, working with Sacred Vibes, um, Apothecary, I am Jamaican, she's Guyanese. I mean, um, a lot of our ancestry is similar. So therefore, you know, we connect and, you know, talk about herbs in a, a similar way. But a lot of my gardening um, is um, growing culturally appropriate crops, crops that can grow here, like Kalaloo. Um, we grow gungo peas, you uh, folks call it gandules. We, we, yeah. Yeah, I successfully grow that, successfully grow Jamaican sorrel. So just things that harken back to home that I remember and I loved eating as a child, um, I try I try to grow here. It um, Scotch bonnet peppers, you know. Um, and it's good that I can grow them here. The heat island effect of the concrete jungle that we live in. <laughs> makes it possible to grow some of those things sometimes. So, you know, that's a, that's a way, um, that's one of the ways in my, in my farming that I, I honor my ancestral, my ancestors by growing what they grew and, and preparing it in the way they prepare. Cause I prepared the, the rice and gungo peas the same way my grandmother did, my mother did. I prepared a callaloo the same way. Um, my mother did, and I work with a lot of um, refugees in, in, and you know that, you know, in, in the spaces. Yeah. So I understand when they come and they bring their own seeds that they want to connect with, with, with their ancestry as well. And because I know how it, what it means to me, I always try to extend the benefit to them to see how can we grow this? How can we create the microclimate? in New York City to even grow some of this stuff. So I think, you know, growing the foods that I love is a great way to honor your ancestors. 100%. I really love about the work that you do, um, Cheryl, is that, you know, I grew up in buildings, like the, the building that, that the Cali Street Community Garden is in. Um, and my experience of like, going down to those sub basements was like a bunch of trash cans and it's smelling like crap and rats everywhere. Exactly. So, and the first time that I went down there and it was like green stuff everywhere and a beautiful space, it was like, what? Or even I used to, you know, I used to pass, I think, new routes all the time to the concourse and I never knew like that was there. I used to work right by there. Yeah, and because six years later, there's a farm. <laughs> it's a farm, yes, exactly. You see, yeah. yeah. To Isanet, how is working in service to community in the Dominican Republic compared to New York City? You know, I'm thinking of immigrating, so I want to know. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I've been I've been really lucky that as soon as I arrived here, um, I got plugged into a community um, farm garden space. 
here in the Dominican Republic and started working for an organization called Cabaret de Sostenible. Um, and also the, that I now live in a house that has a garden. So that's different. <laughs> um, and so the work um, is, yeah, yeah, it's much different. Um, it's definitely about going to where the people are. So mm -hmm. I started working with Cabaret Sustainable, but I also started um, going to the border between the Dominican Republic and Haiti mm -hmm. and um, working with um, some Haitian folks who have been displaced from, from living here in the Dominican Republic. The Dominican Republic has um, a, a policy that was passed about eight years ago eight, maybe 10 years ago, that was stripping um, Dominican Haitian people of their citizenship. And so a lot of people were, even if they had never been into Haiti, literally got kicked off this part of the island. Mm -hmm. And so they have built like, what well, we know in New York City, like 10 cities. Yeah. They have built that in like in the mountains. So mm -hmm. I'm, I've been going every four to five months since I've been here um, to, to that community. And the last project we did is that we started um, doing like permaculture style um, gardens be, um, in, in one person's house. And then a bunch of the community members were involved so that they could see a model and then replicate it. And what we found was um, that one, we weren't really there to teach, that we were there mostly to remind. Yes. Which I always know. That was, yep. That's always the case. It's yep. always like, we came here, yes. no, we really came here to remind you because as soon as we start, I was like, oh yeah, I know that. I was doing that when I was, mm, so, yeah. it's so humbling, you know, you, you think that you have all the knowledge and then you are reminded that they, have, that they know how to do this already, you know? Yes, yes. And I'm always so grateful for, for that humbling experience and, and that reminder of, of my own. And it was pretty, we pretty much have only been um, kind of supporting them in getting the materials so that they can um, be self-sustainable. So the next project that we have coming up now in May is um, supporting them in building and um, building their own houses um, with the, you know, with soil, with the, 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 the horse or, 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 or cow manor that they have and then, um, um, what's, I forgot the word in English, when, when, when grass is dry, hay, 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 hay right? yeah. Yeah. So with hay, yeah, all of that. So, um, yeah, so that's basically the next project. So, yeah, so the difference has been that there isn't a lot of, like, New York City has so many community gardens here. There really isn't that, and I think- We have houses and land. Huh? People have houses and land. We don't have it. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So it's mostly supporting people in growing stuff in their houses, mm -hmm. especially now during COVID um, and the pandemic when there was like so much food insecurity. Mm -hmm. And so it's been, it's been a Cabareta Sostenible. Their work has been reminding people that they have guard, they have backyard space and they could grow food. Exactly. In their homes. Um, mm -hmm. And then with, the the space in the border um or the community at the border is also reminding them like even though it doesn't matter if if you get kicked out like the land will always provide for you, we'll find for you. it can provide food mm -hmm. and it can provide housing and so it's just about like coming together as collectives to do that work because it's hard work like literally putting all these things together to build blocks that are not going to dry and then we have to put them together to build a house mm -hmm. you know it's not easy work like making gardens from scratch in each home so it's really um the mm -hmm. yeah so that has been like um in terms of comparison that has been most of my that yeah that has been like the key difference the the way that it happens you know you reminded me of growing up in in an on an island um as a child growing up in jamaica we would walk home from school and you know, it's houses and yards. So you would walk through people's backyards and there'd be fruit trees. So on your way home, you'd be climbing people's fruit trees and eating <laughs> different, 
different things on the way home. So, you know, um, you know, one of the things my husband said when he went to Jamaica was like, you can't starve here because there's so many, there's so many fruit trees. And I said, yeah, growing up on our way home, by the time we got home, we were so filled that we wouldn't eat dinner, you know, because yeah. we would be sampling the foods from the, the fruits from other people's backyards. And, you know, sometimes the neighbor would chase you out of their yard, but you still did it anyway, because nothing yeah. was going to happen to you. <laughs> I would always do that. I would always climb through the neighbor's um, roof yeah. and then climb down their guava tree. Oh, it was mangoes um, for us. Yeah, <laughs> like that. Yeah, like stealing mangoes, no, yeah. guavas, cherries, <laughs> all of that. Yeah. It's also nice, like my um, yesterday, a friend came over to to visit me and my friends, and she brought over beer and jackfruit, and I was like, oh, great! Now, now this week, I'm gonna have jackfruit. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I remember those. <laughs> those were the days. They should grow fruit trees on the um instead of. We should have fruit trees on the streets of New York, so people could just yeah. harvest fruits, apples, something, pears. How about that? One hundred percent. That's that's a dent in justice. Yeah. So, Cheryl, I also have another question for you. Um, what advice would you have for young black women and femmes who want to go into farming? Hmm is to rem one the first thing that comes to mind for me is to remember that the majority of food planted on this planet are by women and mostly peasant women that's the first thing and um to keep at the forefront that because most of the food is grown by women um on the planet is why there is so much oppression so to be vigilant and to remember that going into farming is not just about growing food, but it is always about justice and it is always about liberation. So if we have that in the forefront of our minds, we will be the catalyst, continue to push against the forces of oppression and be the catalyst for change. And um, I am gonna go off on a limb and say we bring um, empathy to the food system um we bring tremendous knowledge to the food system peasant farmers are the best farmers in the world they have the skill and the knowledge that's why they are all over the united states harvesting our food um and um we honor them when we go into farming because um we are we must come armed with better knowledge to to overturn the existing system that, that's my advice. It's not going to be easy, but it is the right work to do. Yes. Yes, for sure. <laughs> Your certificates in urban agriculture and permaculture design. Yeah, I want to see you incorporate those into your agricultural practice and create a model for us to replicate a good, a sustainable model, a model that we get, because most of the models out there, I want one that's for our people. <laughs> yeah, so my, you know, my the, the work I did in, in, in learning about permaculture was all about how to live and place things in a way that like makes sense, mm -hmm. and also a lot of observing so one of the things like, you know, as I, I move forward with, with, you know, purchasing land here and, and, and living off that land, it's not going to be like a thing where I buy land tomorrow and then, you know, in one month I have a farm, and blah, but it's literally about like sitting on that land and observing when it rains, where does it rain the most? And then, you know, figuring out where the house is going to be, where the, the farm is going to be, where the animals will live, like all of all of that, according to the, the trends of, of Mother Earth and the environment. Um, and I really would, one of the things that um, I really enjoy about permaculture is thinking about irrigation systems Wow. Um, coming from the actual land versus, mm -hmm. you know, the new technology that, that we've, that we've learned. And so, um, um, 
yeah, so for me, um, I, you know, enjoyed learning about um, using using the, the the trunk of like a plantain tree. Um, like once if once, you know, naturally it, it falls down, um, cutting that in half and placing it in, in the pathways um, of let's say you have like a, you, you know, here we have the beds are on the ground. The yeah. Beds, yeah. And so in the pathways, like putting putting those, and then when it rains, it's like a sponge. And so then when you walk on it, yeah. like that sponge is releasing yeah. water into into the crops. So like that is that is an irrigation system in itself. Mm-hmm. So yeah, so those are those are like little things. Also, what I mentioned about you know mixing mixing soil, um, um, cow or horseshit and and hay. And you know, st- literally making your own blocks and making a bunch of them, and then building your house in that way. Mm-hmm. And so, so yeah. So I think those are like two small ways of, of that I definitely want to um, incorporate permaculture into into my other projects. Yeah, I I I, I am interested um, in. I mean, this for me, this would be the last thing before I depart this planet is to work on a you know on a regenerative model. You know something that harkens from, you know, you know ancient or wins wisdom and, and and knowledge and um, build a model that you know that is resilient and sustainable. And, and um, I I believe that I need to remember that even though I'm a farmer, that agriculture is artificial. It's something that we impose upon the land, and therefore we need to dial it back and come up with system, more systems that help to repair repair the planet. Yes, I know we need to feed 7 billion people, mm-hmm. but at the same time, we need to have some balance where we are regenerating the earth while we are while we are feeding people. And I think more of us need to practice these, incorporate these holistic practices. Yeah, 100%. All right, so now we're moving into some question and answer with the audience. Really? We have questions? Um, yeah. So Elka Lopez asked, um, are there any places in or close to NYC to learn to do restorative, regenerative farming and gardening? Um, I know a little bit, but I'll give that to you, Cheryl, since you're there. Um, I don't do, one of the places I know of that I would visit is Smiling Hothead Ranch in, um, in, in Long Island City. They do some permaculture work. Um, I, you know, Gil Lopez is uh, is one of the gardeners there that I know very well. But generally speaking, most urban agriculture is in in New York City is raised beds, and there's a push for more rooftop and aquaponics and hydroponics. Not that I'm against um, um, technology, but you know, that's why I'm asking you: Where are there more of those places in New York City? Besides the courses that we normally do with folks that come from outside of New York City to teach us, yeah. and, Smiling, and Smiling Hogshead Ranch has a website online. You can you can look them up. Yeah, I, I don't think there is like one. There's like one place where you can get it all. Yeah, I think maybe it's about. Um, you know, looking up what what makes what makes up like regenerative farming and gardening, and like seeing what places you know are doing that. Like you know, what places is use is doing aquaponics or beekeeping mm-hmm. or um, you know like uh, irrigation without like um, tubes and things like that. Um, so yeah, it's definitely also about relationship building. Mm-hmm. That has been my experience. So I feel like I've been I've tapped into one garden, you know, I do a little bit of work here. In conversation, I mentioned, you know, I'm really interested in like beekeeping. And then someone, you know, she used Cheryl specifically connected me to someone who was doing that in New York, um, and so forth. So I would start with one thing because it takes a long time to learn. Um, anything in farming, I feel like the more I learn, the less I know. So start with some one thing, and then build relationships with people who can point you in the direction of of other other experiences. All 
All right. Do you have another question? Oh, last words. <laughs> oh, I'm so grateful. Cheryl, again, like, what an honor to be here with you, to um, have been um, guided briefly by you to share the common experience of farm school. Um, and, you know, you are someone who really showed me the importance of like showing up to this work. Um, you know, I'm someone who has my hands dipped in like different projects. And one of the things that I'd say the pandemic has allowed me to do is to slow down and give space to, to the practice of growing food, mm -hmm. which while wow, I love New York City, it was always such a challenge to make it to the garden, to make it to the farm. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. um, but it, you know, it didn't, um, you know, it was always present on my mind, like the commitment that you have mm -hmm. to growing food and to growing food for our people. So yeah, just, just really grateful and, and blessed to have had this opportunity in this way um, with you today. And also thank you to um, Rib Cultural Center uh, of African Diaspora Institute. <laughs> <laughs> um, I thank you for that. Um, I am also honored to reconnect with you. I ask about you all the time, um, what you're doing. You know, if, um, I have a couple of friends here that were going to the DR and I said, you know, I should hook you up with my friend Isanet from Walk Foods. But um, my last word is that I think the pandemic or where we are today gives us the opportunity to stop, to pause and rethink a new normal or a next normal that is completely different from what we had before. We have this chance and we shouldn't squander it. Um, and if it is even one little change that we can make from the status quo um, in this work that we do, we should seize the opportunity. I don't want to go back to what was, you know, I mean, I think about what was, it's so, it's so dismal and oppressive um, that I would like to think that this is a chance for us to begin again. Yes, definitely. And then thank you to everyone that is watching on YouTube and Facebook, and as well as the folks that were in the comments section. Um, I, I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of your all of your questions, but I'm sure that um, you know Shara and I are both on 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 the interwebs on the social media, so don't hesitate to chat. Thank you for having me. This was this was so great. <laughs>